captions already. So, I get a ton of questions all the time about the CFTC data, the reports, how do you use the data, how do you look at the data, how do you, you know, interpret the data to make trading decisions. So I thought I uh, would spend some time going through the CFTC data, where we get it, how we collect it, what we do with it, and all that good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the first thing I'll show you guys is the website. Okay, this is the CFTC Commodity Futures Trading Commission. <clears throat> okay. And uh, so you can see the uh, website right here. This is where I go to get the data every weekend. Now, many people have asked me, is there a way to automate the spreadsheet so you can um, make the spreadsheet and then the data gets automatically updated, in, updated into the spreadsheet? Yes, there's ways. There's ways to do that, and people have done that. Okay, people have made those spreadsheets and they've even offered it to me. But here's my take on that. I personally personally like to do things manually, all right? I find that there is just a lot of um, advantages for doing things manually. I've learned that myself just by doing the, uh, the, day, uh, the analysis on the charts, looking at the raw data, looking at the raw candlesticks, and manually drawing supply and demand and my trend lines. You know, I've also received many questions in regards to, um, you know, what kind of uh, uh, automatic, uh, what do you call those things, indicators, or um, uh, I forget the name, but uh, you load all these different indicators and stuff on your charts, and then they automatically draw the support and resistance and supply demand and all that stuff yes I've seen that I've seen indicators that automatically draws zones and stuff and you know what they're all wrong I'm sorry to say but they're all wrong I've looked at them before and they are disastrous okay so um, in my mind the minute you hand over your power to something so that it can make decisions for you or do the work for you you're automatically losing control of something that you should remain in control of. That's my personal opinion. And I know you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but what's the big deal about grabbing some data and tossing it inside of a, a spreadsheet? You know, if you have a spreadsheet, what's the big deal of those cells being automatically filled in with numbers? Well, if it's no big deal for you, then do it. All I will say is, if you have it automatically filled in, you will never know what I know about doing it manually. That's it. I, I can't convince you if you're if you're sold on doing it the way you want to do it, then you're going to do it the way you're going to do it. I can't change your mind about that. But what I can tell you is that I, I reap the benefits of doing it manually and I can't really put into words what those benefits are. All right. I have a routine every single weekend. Friday comes, sometimes I do it Saturday depending on what's going on in my life. But usually um, on Friday, the data will come out. I'll make myself a tea or I'll make myself a coffee. I come down to my desk. I sit down. I go to this website here. Okay? Same thing. Every weekend, I scroll down to this section here current legacy reports. Okay? And right here, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's the one that I want. And then I click on here, short format. And that takes me to all the currency pairs, the major ones, okay, the main uh, currency pairs. And I click on that, and um, the data comes up. And I like to just. shorten my window like this I have this on one screen and I have my spreadsheet on the other one and I like to run through I always scroll down scroll down and then after Russian is Canadian there's Russian ruble right here 
and then the Canadian dollar. All right. So the first thing I do is I look at what is here, Canadian dollar, and I look at these columns here, long, short. Okay, there's non-commercial, commercial, Canadian dollar. There's long, there's the short, and then there's the long of commercial and the short of commercial. All right, so this is where I begin. And I take this data on here and I copy it. So I take my tool and I copy these cells like this and I make a replica of that down below. And I change the date to reflect the, the date of the data and then I start filling in my information on these cells. So this gives me a brief overlook of the positions and how they changed. I like this page here on my spreadsheet because it gives me a brief overlook okay I get to see it you know and I get to see what the changes were right so the US dollar longs 27,000 shorts 24,000 and that's non-commercial that's the hedge funds banks institutions that are betting on uh, making money buying when it goes up and selling when it goes down right and uh, the commercials, the corporations that are hedging, they're usually going against what they think the value is going to do. If they think the U.S. dollar is going to go down, they want to be more long. If they think it's going to go up, they're going to be more short. So they're always going and doing the opposite of what they think um, the, uh, the, how the, the dollar is going to, to go or whatever asset they're um, investing in. And you know what? I get a lot of people coming up to me saying, well, that's not what I was told. I was told that the commercials are the big players. They are the ones that with the major money, so you want to do what they do. Well, yeah, you would be told that, wouldn't you? All right? Just like we were discussing how um, the media lures people into taking the exact opposite of the trades that the banks are taking. Well, when it comes to the CFTC data, what do you think would be the advice to follow the non-commercial the ones that are actually speculating on the markets whether it goes up they want to buy if they go if it goes down they want to short would you not want to be following those guys why would you be following the commercial when you when you investigate what the commercial are doing they are just hedging against real positions that they carry so it only would make sense to be focusing on the non-commercial so again, that is another myth that you should follow the commercials. You should not follow the commercials. You follow the commercials, you get yourself in trouble. You'll be doing the exact opposite of what you should be doing. All right, so uh, when I plug the data in here, when I come here and I look at the data, the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at longs. And then I'm looking at my data because when I copy and paste this portion of my Excel spreadsheet, I get to see the data from the previous week inside these cells. Okay, And so uh, the other question I always get is why did you switch long and short positions? Well, because these are futures contracts. Okay, So when you look at a futures contract, the chart, if the Canadian dollar is getting stronger, price is going up the chart. Okay. But if you look on a U.S. CAD chart, if the Canadian dollar is getting stronger, price is dropping on the chart. Why? Because it's the U.S. dollar slash Canadian dollar. Whatever currency comes before, that's the main currency. So if price is dropping, that means that currency at the beginning is getting weaker and the other one is getting stronger. Unlike the futures contract, if you look at a chart of just the Canadian dollar futures contract if it's getting stronger in price it rallies up okay so I know that if the institutions are adding to their long positions when it comes to the US CAD they're adding to their short positions 
okay? Because the U.S. CAD will drop as the Canadian dollar gets stronger. That's why I switch. And I only switch them for the CAD, the Swiss, and the yen. Why? Well, because those are the only ones that have the U.S. dollar in front of it. U.S. CAD, U.S. Swiss, U.S. Japanese yen. All the other ones have the other currencies in front. Aussie U.S., Euro U.S., Pound U.S., Kiwi U.S. dollar. All right? So that's why I switch them. Because I don't trade futures contracts, I trade currency pairs. If I traded futures contracts, I wouldn't switch them. But because I trade currency pairs, I do. All right? So, um, so going back to uh, the data, so I come here and I grab the data, 82,000, and I automatically plug it into this field here. And as I'm plugging it into that field, I'm looking at what it was before. Okay, what was the number before? And I'm automatically thinking about what I've been pondering all week. If I'm looking at price action doing this on the charts, what is the story of price? What is taking place? What's the banks doing? Why are they doing it? So I'm building up these questions in my mind all throughout the week. Because I'm constantly looking at the charts and I'm trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together of what the banks are doing with price. Are they about to take profits on those major short positions that they've been accumulating? We're getting pretty close to supply. What do I typically see during this phase of the market? Are they typically closing positions, closing short positions? So what would I want to see in the, in the data next time the data is released? So I'm building up this suspense, okay? I'm building up the suspense throughout the week. When the data comes, I can't wait to see the data. I can't wait to compare the data with the previous week's data. So I can see what my suspicions were, if they were correct or if they weren't. Or if I have no idea what to expect, I, I can't wait to see what the data is so that I can start building a picture in my mind and putting the pieces of the, of the evidence together to, to create an idea of what is taking place. So I like this, um, this overview here because, like I mentioned, I plug in the figures here and it automatically tells me what the net positions are. Okay, so um, if we've got, um, let's say, uh, long positions, 27,000 for the U.S. dollar, short positions. So if you're long 27 and short 24, then your net positions are 2,600, okay? Just like U.S. CAD, if you're long 35, but then you're short 82, the difference is 46, minus 46,000, okay? And then I look at commercials as well, right? Longs and shorts, and then that gives me net positions. So, yes, it is important to take into consideration the commercials because the commercials are investing big money in the markets, yes. But I would not pay attention to their actual positions. If they're very bullish, the U.S. CAD, which you can see they are, net positions 74,000, okay? If they're very bullish, if you know that they're only opening up position, uh, positions to hedge against real assets that they have, then the more bullish they are, they're really bearish, okay? They're really bearish. So for me, I want to take that number that is bullish and I want to make it useful for me as if it was a bearish number okay so what I do is I do a calculation to calculate this minus 46,000 and I add this as a negative number to that minus 46,000 which gives me a total of negative 1,000 121,000 so now I know overall between the non-commercial and the commercial just how bearish they are. Okay? So that tells me a lot right there. That tells me a lot just how bearish they are taking into consideration the commercial and non-commercial positions. So that is how I incorporate the, uh, the, the figures from the commercials. This is how I use their information. I don't take their bullishness and make it um, make me believe that 
price is going to become bullish. Okay? It doesn't influence me to believe it that way or to look at it that way. I look at it as a very bearish number. I just put a minus in front of it. So uh, the difference of the previous week is what was that difference in number the previous week? It was negative 104,000. So what's the change from last week to this week? They added negative 16,000. So over the week, I know just by a quick glance of this that they are have gone more negative, okay, more bearish with their position. So that's why I like this overview because really quickly I can just glance and see exactly what just took pl place over the last week, okay. So once I get that done, what I do is if you look at the bottom here, I have tabs: for the U.S. dollar, Aussie. All of them, gold, silver, copper, oil, not gas, oil, heating oil, and propane. So what I do now is I, in each of these tabs, I have all the data that I collect and I copy and paste from this main chart here. I copy and paste all of the data into these columns. Okay? And the data, as you can see, I can scroll back, it goes and goes and goes and goes all right I have all the historical data from day one since they started collecting data I have it all all right but not all of the information is 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 um, is relative to to what we are doing now and so I'll give you an, an example of why it's not <clears throat> So, for instance, you know, if you look back um, when they started collecting the data, <clears throat> let's just take a look here, for instance. Let's look at the euro, okay? We got the maximum right here. We got the maximum, the minimum, right? Here we go. Right here. So let me just bring that up. Okay, so max positions were 266. And that's for longs, okay? 266K. And uh, for shorts, it was 271K. So if you go back uh, when they started collecting um, positions, the data is not. Um, it's not anywhere close. The positions that they held is not anywhere close to what they are holding now. Okay? You look at them and they were like 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 long, you know, 15, 20,000 short. It's nowhere clear, uh, close to where we are today. So, <clears throat> the value in collecting the data is to know the difference between how they're holding positions now and how they were holding them yesterday and last week and last month and two months ago and six months ago and one year ago. That is the power of, of collecting the data is being able to um, put it up against historical data and then comparing what they did in the past to what they're doing now. That is where the power is. So I don't want to compare uh, this week's data with data from uh, the, the 80s because it's not going to be uh, relatable all right they're, they're two different things so if you've got um, you know in the 80s data was down here this stuff is not usable for me but the, in the last year you have data here 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 in, in, in terms of size okay so let's say this was 200k and here it was 266 okay and all throughout here it goes up to 10 to 20 and so forth okay if you're looking at the data and, and you see that there's a buildup of data like that what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a look at this data and see where it relates to the chart and get an idea of why they had that many positions when price was doing whatever it was doing on the charts okay but I want to compare today's data with all this data alright it's almost like a moving average right price is where it's at now 
but if you look at so we have you know price is doing this right and then you have a moving average okay that's the green moving average and price is here now but you know based on the moving average that <clears throat> this is above average of where price is right price is above average because the moving average is taking all, all all of the data for the last week or 10 days or 20 days or whatever all the prices and then adding it together and then dividing it by that many days and giving you an average so you can tell that where price is right now it's above average because you can compare it to a moving average so we do something very similar with that because again we always want to compare what the positions are now to what it has been. So we're always doing that. And so let me bring you back to the spreadsheet. So here's the spreadsheet. And so here's data right here. And if you take a look here, 13 period, period average. That's my number, 13 period average, OK? Now some people ask me, why do you use a 13 period average? Why not a 14 or a 20 or... Well, because I've tested a bunch of them. For years I tested, when I came up with this idea of having an average number, I was realizing that, you know, when price... You know, let's say we have an institutional area of demand on the chart, okay? And let's say, you know, price is coming down and it contacts this institutional area of demand. What will happen is that as price is dropping, the banks are adding short positions majorly, right? But sometimes they'll start adding in long positions as well as price gets down here. Okay? And so this is a, a phenomenon that takes place all the time. And the reason why they're doing this is that they're preparing to shift momentum to the upside. <clears throat> and so if you take the average of all the positions throughout down here, okay, if we're looking at all the positions that were being held as price was making this move down, remember we want an average of all the shorts and an average of all the longs. And what you'll see is that, you know, let's say short positions right now are 250,000, okay? But the average is 230,000. So when we compare what the actual number is right now, with what the average is, we can tell that right now short positions are above average. All right? You see how that works? So, price is dropping really hard. Short positions are above average because the average is 230,000. But what will happen is that they'll start to close off those short positions and they'll start to do it aggressively to uh, the point that this 250,000 will eventually become 220,000. And by the time that takes place, this average will probably drop to, let's say, you know, just ballpark, uh, or it will go up because it'll catch up to these high numbers down here. So let's say it's 240K. So then you would look at the real positions of shorts and you'd see the banks are holding 220,000 short. But the average is 240, which is telling you that current positions are below average. So based on what was taking place all throughout this drop, based on this whole dynamic of this drop in price, the current positions held by the banks right now are below the average. So if I went to you and I said, hey, listen, um, do you want to go long or short the U.S. CAD right now? 
you if you were to say well I want to only do what the banks are doing and if I just came to you and said well I'll tell you one thing I'll tell you one thing that they're holding long positions and they have 170,000 K long and you'd say okay interesting what about their short positions oh their short positions they they hold 220,000 short now automatically if you didn't do any logical thinking about this you would just say oh longs are 170 shorts are a lot higher 220,000 so I think I want to be in short aha but that is if you just didn't think about this on a deeper level this is all you would extract from it but you have to think about this on a deeper level that's why I always mention that thinking logically and critically is essential to understanding the CFTC data. It's not just about looking at the numbers and saying, oh, well, if they're short 220,000 and they're only long 170,000, then of course I want to be short. But now if I add in this other piece of information and I say, well, before you make your trading decision, let me just tell you. The last 13 uh, periods where the data came out, based on the average size of the last 13 periods, they would be 240,000 short. And they're only 220 right now. So they're below average, okay? Which is telling you that there's a shift in the momentum in, and the direction that these positions are going in. They are not building higher, they are reducing, all right? So if I, if I now went up to you and said, hey, the US CAD, would you like to go short or would you like to go long the US CAD? Your question could be, well, I wanna know two things. One, what are the positions held by the banks? And I said, well, they're holding 220,000 short. And you're like, okay. What are they doing with these positions right now? Oh, good question. They're actually getting, uh, they're offloading these positions. What they've been doing up until today is recently they've been offloading those short positions. So they're, they're, they're giving those short positions to somebody else and taking profits on those short positions. Okay, now that tells me something different. What about their long positions? Oh, longs? Yeah, no problem. Uh, longs, they used to be 150,000. But now they're 170,000. Oh, so they're accumulating long positions. Yes, they're accumulating long positions. Okay. Their average used to be 150,000. And now let's say the average is 170,000. So shorts... The average, we see that new positions are way below average, which means there is a shift in the dynamic of what they're doing with their positions. All right, they're no longer accumulating, they're offloading. So we really don't want to be getting into a short position when the banks are offloading a position, all right? That wouldn't be a good idea. We want to time what we do with what the banks are doing, all right? If, if the average long was 150k but then later on it became 170k okay and their actual long positions let's say was 185k you'd say hold on for a second the average right now is 170 but their actual positions are 185,000 yes that's right so based on the last 13 periods of data the average is 170 and they're actually above that yes that's correct so what does that tell you that means the momentum at which the banks are accumulating long positions is pretty aggressive so much so that it's not sitting at the average size of positions it's above average so they're accumulating it at a fast pace so even though short positions could be at 220k and long positions are at 185k you wouldn't think well shorts are bigger than long so I want to go in short you wouldn't think that 
you would have to analyze the data, put it into its context, extract the information from it, and come to re the realization that they are shifting the momentum with their with their positions and what they're doing with their positions. Okay, so that is how you extra extract the the information to determine what is likely going to take place. So that is what this 13th period period average is over here. It gives me the 13 period average of the, the positions held by the banks. And if we take a look at the euro, look at the long positions, 232,000. Look what the average is, 206,000. Okay? You see how much higher 232 is from 206? Aggressive, right? But I'll point out something out to you. Look at the average size of short positions, 110. Look at the actual positions of short positions 132 do you not see aggressiveness on both sides so both longs and shorts are aggressively accumulating you see that that's important information because you see how we extracted you know using the example of the US CAD how we could determine that it would probably be a bad idea to be getting in short if they were shifting that momentum to offloading short positions, right? Well, when we look at this, what do we see? We see that they are aggressively accumulating both longs and shorts based on what their positions have been recently. So that's important information to, to recognize. We want to know that, right? And that will play a role in how price it will eventually play out. Okay, so we keep our eyes on that. So um, so this is what we do. This is what I do every weekend. And when I plug that data in here, I just click up with my mouse here, and here's May 25th, ready for inserting new data. When this Friday comes and I got the new data, I'll be creating this main chart here, plugging in all the information, and then copying and pasting that information into my chart here. And as I'm plugging the information in, I am looking and comparing what price was previously and what it is now okay and I'm picturing what price looks like on the chart and comparing what I see with the data re realizing what it is that they're doing increasing or offloading or decreasing and automatically my brain is thinking about what I know logically about what I'm seeing what I've been able to piece together by examining the caught data for many years and um, I tried to put together a picture of what is likely taking place. So it's a whole process that I go through and I like to do it manually. I can't even think about you know coming to my spreadsheet and then having the data already plugged in. I feel like I would be robbed of something you know. I feel like I'd be cheated of something. I feel like I would be cheated of that little extra moment where I get to click on that and look at the numbers and actually type in the numbers myself and actually compare it with my eyes as I look at the other cells. So um, so I like to do it manually, all right? So that I think is a very good introduction to the caught data and the importance of the caught data and how I extract the information, uh, plug it into my spreadsheet, the calculation that it does, um, and, and why I, I like this 13 period average. And again, the 13 period, period average, people ask me why 13 periods. Um, you know, I've used 20, I've used uh, so many different ones. 14, 15, 16, 10, 7, 8. I've used the uh, Fibonacci numbers, okay? <laughs> I've used I've used a lot. All right, so if you can just pause for two seconds and hit the like button for me, I'd appreciate it. Show me that you um, that you are enjoying the content that I'm uh, sharing with you today. These are things that have taken me a long time to put together. Okay, it has taken me a long time to put this together, and I'm constantly building on my knowledge every single every single weekend when I put the data together. I'm constantly building, and it takes me a long time. It's a major, major commitment. 
because every weekend when I put together the uh, the Arugia report, uh, I'm spending at least um, about 20 hours at least every weekend where I go through the data, plug it in, I go to my charts, I compare the data to the charts, I look at historical charts, I look at the historical data, I look at past patterns, what they did, how they did it. I, I, I reanalyze my, my zones, I reanalyze my trend lines, and I, I put the picture together of what is likely taking place, and then I have to do it for the pound, and the yen, and the kiwi, and the US CAD, and the Aussie, and the US dollar. And then I compare the stories with each other. It's like an investigator goes to the crime scene, right? There's one crime that's been committed, meaning there's only one story that's really in play. And all the markets have to be in line with that story. That's just how it works, right? So it's looking at all the different stories comparing all the stories together to see if if they are relatable in any way and if there is no relation then there's a problem then that means something is not right so then I have to go back into the storyline and figure out what part of the story whose story is not in line with with what's going to, what's taking place in the overall markets so that it's it takes up a lot of time even with the um, the experience that I have it still takes up a lot of time and to be honest I put in the extra time that is not even necessary sometimes because I love the process because I love the information that I get to pull out of the markets by by doing this okay so it takes me a long time and that's uh, the eventual uh, outcome is the Arugia report all right uh, I could give you a quick look at that I'll give you a, a, a view of our latest Arusha report that uh, was completed, May 23rd report. So, um, so after a careful analysis of the markets and the data, I, I, I do this report. Okay, I do a market summary where I go through the key things that we're watching for in the markets. They they are the key the key storylines, right? Uh, that are taking place in the markets and the key charts that I'm watching and why I'm watching them and not what I'm watching for uh, for uh, momentum to kick into the markets or for trades all right so like um, when it comes to gold I'll put down here what I am seeing in the storyline of gold what the data represents why it represents it and what we're waiting for there's an overview price consolidated on the weekly chart the banks increased their longs again from 282 to 290,000 at the same time they also increased shorts from 89,000 to 91,000 we saw the breakout uh, take place this past week this is what we were waiting for and now ideally we want to see the uptrend sentiment is starting to turn bullish now for there to be sustainable momentum we want we would want to see at least a daily uptrend form from these lows without the monthly demand breaking okay so we were expecting certain things to take place now why do I put these things okay why do I put these things well this is what we are waiting for the reason being is because how do you know if your analysis is correct unless you put yourself out there and make forecasts and then see what eventually happens so we are constantly doing that at the school okay we are constantly putting out forecasts even in 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 circumstances in the markets when um, the markets are not highly predictable we are always putting out forecasts I personally am always putting out forecasts why because this is how we learn I'm looking at the data and I'm trying to figure out what's the storyline so if you know what the storyline is then you would know what is going to be coming in the following week it's like a movie right you're halfway through the movie you've seen this th these type of movies before and you're like oh watch what's gonna happen in the next scene they're probably gonna be you know best friends again they're gonna get over this argument that they had and they're gonna be best friends again and then the next scene is exactly how you thought so the markets are the same way I look at it the same way 
I look at what's taking place and I, I see all the data, I collect all the data, I do the analysis on the data, and then I make my forecast. Based on what I'm seeing, here's the storyline, this is how I'm seeing it, and it's likely going to do this next. And then the next report will be like, well, boom, isn't that what we were expecting, that breakout to the upside? Well, we did indeed get that, which means the interpretation of the data was correct. And so I do this every single week. And this is how we learn. Students that join, they read these reports, and this is how they build up their understanding and build up the logic of how to read the data. Okay, It's a whole process of understanding how the data uh, reflects on the charts and how to forecast what price will do. All right. So that's what we do with the uh, Arusia report. And um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. That was a good uh, session today on an in a good introduction to the uh, Arusia report and uh, and the caught data. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll run through um, the chat here. If you guys have a minute to hit the like button, I would appreciate that as well. And uh, we'll go through uh, your questions. Let's see. Oh, we got a lot of things, a lot of comments here. Uh, indicators are for lazy people. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Kevin. Is there any value in tracking Euro, FX, British pound? I haven't found any value in that. I haven't found any value in that. The, the cross pairs, following the cross pairs data. You don't need to. You don't need to because, and we'll talk about this in future sessions. <clears throat> you look at the, the, the main pairs and you look at their charts and you figure out their storylines. And so if you figure out their storylines, then you know what's likely going to happen on those charts. So if you know that the euro is very likely to be strong, and you know that the yen is very likely to not get either strong or uh, weak in in the weeks to come, then you know the euro yen is a good tr uh, chart to trade long. Okay, so there's a there's a power in in just getting the information from the major pairs, looking at the charts, reading the storyline, and then all the cross pairs. You'll know which ones are good to trade based on just that information. Um. We will have the Excel sheet so we can edit it weekly. No, I don't give away my Excel sheet. This is my baby that I've, I've spent many, many years working on and creating. I don't just give out this spreadsheet. I encourage people to create their own spreadsheet. All right. And, you know, I've, I've had students come up to me and they're like, why don't you just give us your spreadsheet? And it's like, well, when somebody gives you something, how, how much do you appreciate it? How much work do you put into it? How much value do you have with it? My spreadsheet is my world, all right? And because it's so value to me, uh, so valuable to me, I don't just give it away to anybody. I don't. <clears throat> so those same students, I, I say, listen, here's how you make it. I have video lessons on how to create it, how to, how to code it and all that stuff and all the formulas. And all you have to do is start plugging in the data. Uh, when you become a Sherlock member at the school, and those are for those that are putting in the work and effort and really, really showing that they are interested in learning and excelling as a trader, I make them um, uh, members of the Sherlock uh, Club. And once you're a member there, I have all hi of the historical data there that you could just plug into your, your, uh, your spreadsheets. But I don't just give that away to everybody. It doesn't work that way. In life, you have to work and you get, you reap the benefits of it. You don't just join something, pay a few bucks, and then think you're going to get everything. It doesn't work. Life doesn't work that way. And it's in your best interests for it to not work that way. Those who actually said, okay, fine, I'll just do the work. I'll do the spreadsheet. Fine, you want to give it. You don't want to give it to me. They make the spreadsheet. They come back six months later, and they're like, thank you so much for making me make the spreadsheet. I'm like, now do you understand? He goes, and they say, yes, now I understand. If you would have just given it to me, I wouldn't have realized the importance of the cells and how it works and why it works. I wouldn't make it my own. It would just be yours automatically doing calculations and I wouldn't quite own it. It wouldn't be quite mine. It wouldn't, you know, so I wouldn't really reap the full benefits of it because it wasn't going to be mine. And I'm like, exactly. 
but could I have explained that to you before? No, you wouldn't have gotten that, correct? And they say, yes, that's correct. Okay, well, now you know why I told you make your own. Because I didn't want to rob you of, of that experience. And so, uh, once you create your own and you start doing it and you put the time and effort into it, it becomes yours. Uh, you work hard through the school. I'll make you a, a member of the Sherlock Club. And then uh, you have access to all the historical data. You plug in that historical data and then you have your own sheet. Then you have your own sheet. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, collecting all of that data, that is dedication. But what you have to do. Yeah, that is dedication, but what you have. Collecting the data is dedication. Yeah, you have no idea. You have no idea how long I've spent collecting data, analyzing data. It's just uh, the amount of my years I've traded to analyze charts, analyze the data, collecting the data. So I have all the historical data. So I've I've saved uh, everyone a lot of, a lot of time. All you got to do is put the time and effort and show me that you really really want to learn. Show me that you're committed. Because when you first join, you don't need a spreadsheet with all the data. You don't need that, all right? You need to work on locating supply and demand zones and drawing your trend lines and doing analysis. That's what you need to work on. But if you're really committed to that and you're really putting in the time and effort, then yes, I'll make you a member and then you'll have access to the data and then eventually you can build your spreadsheets and you can do your own uh, spreadsheets as well. Um, I found Kevin the, through caught data research stayed for the demand and supply teachings. It all makes sense. Yeah, combining supply and demand uh, as we teach it with the trends, the trend lines and the caught data to me, there's nothing in the world more powerful to determine what's going to take place in the markets than combining those two. Nothing. Nothing Nothing comes even close to it. Uh, I would hit like every five minutes, but I can't. Oh, well, priceless. Love it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, if you haven't hit the like button yet, now is a good time to do so. Uh, I like the 13. It shows about one quarter of the data. Yeah, 13 is also um, it's also quarterly, right? 13 weeks. It pretty much is uh, three months, right? So it's quarterly. And so um, I think there might be something to that where quarterly the banks have to reach certain criteria or certain uh, deadlines or certain uh, quotas something is up with that because 13 is that number that just works so well trade price action um, this really puts it all together I will be checking out the White Oak membership oh that's great Blake yeah uh, I spent one hour pulling data and thought I was overdoing it <laughs> You spent one hour pulling data and you thought you were overdoing it. That's funny. Um, when you learn support, uh, supply and demand from Kevin, you will immediately throw support and resistance in the trash. <laughs> uh, do you work on long-term only or any scalping? So, um, so remember in the session that we did yesterday, we were talking about looking at the different time frames and being able to determine what time frame was a green go and what ones were red no okay stop don't look and so uh, collecting the data also allows you to determine what is likely going to take place so if we had monthly chart in the red zone weekly chart in the green zone daily chart in the green zone and four hour chart in the red zone if we're looking at the data and examining what they are doing with their positions and we come to determine that they are likely going to be closing off uh, that what they're doing is closing off a lot of their short positions on the US CAD for instance and they're starting to pile into their long positions <clears throat> then we look at the charts and we realize oh wait a minute daily charts in the green but the four hour isn't so but we can uh, expect or anticipate that the four-hour chart will eventually create an uptrend. Why? 
because this is what they do when they're closing off major short positions after a major drop and they're taking profits on short positions and they start accumulating aggressively with their long positions. This is what they do. They create uptrends on four hour charts. So that is valuable information, especially when you are trying to anticipate the next moves. So price comes down to a four hour demand zone that should be used to facilitate a move higher to create a four hour uptrend. Well, guess what? You can take shorter term trades when price comes down into that four hour area of demand. So using the caught data, even though the data is, you know, only released once a week and it's to give us a bigger picture of what's taking place, this bigger picture can be narrowed down to very smaller time, small time frames. It's all about reading the story of what's taking place with price to determine what is likely going to happen. Okay? So that is how we would use that. So yes, you could take shorter term trades by using the caught data. Okay? It's very possible. All right? And we do it from time to time. I don't focus on the, the shorter time frames uh, because I'm just busy doing other things and looking at the higher time frame uh, charts and I'm involved in trades based on the higher time frame charts and it's just too much work to be drilling down to one hour charts and 15 minute charts on all the pairs that I trade it's just it's too much uh, do you work on long term only okay so I answered that uh, do you look at futures no not I, lo I look at gold oil not so much the uh, indexes um, Juan Ramos, is your overall strategy more scalping or long-term trading? It's more, it's whatever it, I need to, to do, whatever wherever the opportunity is there. If there's a great trading opportunity that is a short-term trade, I'll take it. But my focus is mainly on uh, shorter-term trades, like holding trades for multiple days and swing trades. And at times I'll hold trades for a year or two years, depending on, you know, if there's going to be a massive move. All right when there is a massive move coming from very low on the chart and I believe that it's going to rally up very strongly then I'll start accumulating an overall position down at those lows if I see the banks are getting out of their short positions and accumulating major long positions at major demand low on the chart I'm gonna start accumulating a big uh, long position from those lows and if the targets are very high based on the supply and demand dynamic and I know that price is gonna rally up very high then I'm going to hold those positions for as long as I, I, I need to hold them. I'm not in any rush to get out of them, so I will hold them. Yeah, so it all depends. I, I trade whatever the opportunity is. The power of what it is that we do with supply and demand and reading the data is we can see what dynamic is in play on the charts. We can see if only shorter term moves are expected if midterm moves are uh, expected or longer term moves are expected we know we know when there's a major dynamic shift if if trends were trending downwards if price was trending downwards and momentum was downwards and it comes into contact with major demand and we know that the trend is going to change the upside when this major demand comes into play then we change our the type of trades that we're looking to trade you know those shorter term short trades we throw out the window and we start focusing on shorter term long trades until momentum builds on the higher time frame charts and then we start focusing on longer term long trades so whatever is happening with the charts we can quickly adapt adapt and know exactly what is taking place as it's taking place and we just change the the type of trades that we we look to engage in it's pretty much that simple okay uh, over the years, I'm sure you could spot order flow on the chart. Would you consider the caught report to be more reliable than seeing the order flow on the charts? I've never really studied order flow. I, I get the concept of it, but um, you know, I look at the caught data and it basically tells me the order flow, right? I see it. I see. I can I can compare it to what I see on the charts, and I see exactly what they're doing with their positions, where they're taking profits, where they're getting in. You know, I, I see what's going on. And to know the difference between, while well, they're adding longs only as a hedge, or while well, they're adding longs because they're preparing to push price up, being able to determine those little differences is, is you know, you only get that with the experience of, of you know, 
<clears throat> reading the reports and analyzing the charts and, and seeing the difference between the, the, the two situations. Um, I have fine-tuned one of my sheets to reflect green and red zones to keep me sharp. Nice. Uh, what keeps you motivated when you feel bored? Hmm, that's a good question. What keeps you motivated? Uh, like motivated in what? In trading? I'm passionate about trading, so I've never lost motivation. I've I've always been motivated to to do chart work. And if I'm not motivated to do chart work, I you know do something else. I go for a drive with my family. I go out to the park. I go and garden. I go for a walk. You know, do something different. Live life. You know, you shouldn't be bored. If you're bored, grab a book and read. <laughs> I think the I think the key thing is um, you got to find balance in life. All right, you can't make everything about trading because then you're just gonna eventually get to a point where you're just doing the same thing over and over again, and uh, yeah, you are gonna get feelings of boredom. So uh, find other things to do in life that uh, entertain you. Trading is a business for me. It's a passion, but it's also a business and every decision I make is based on it has to be based on strong analysis if it's not based on strong analysis then I cannot take any trading decisions based on it so I my motivation is there because I just love to get things right I love to know what the story of price is I love to figure out the puzzle it is it is my passion Every time I figure out the puzzle and then I wait a week or two and then price plays out in the in my favor in the direction that I was anticipating it uh, to move in, there's there's so so much um, joy I get from that, so much satisfaction I get from that. It's the ultimate satisfaction, you know. Before when I used to run uh, my family uh, business, so many times I would do uh, so much work but not reap any benefits from it, not ever get rewarded, not ever get a pat on the back, not, not ever get complimented. And it was just, um, you know, it was just not um, a good feeling to get. It was disheartening, okay? And with trading, I'm constantly getting a pat on the back because if, if my work is done correctly, all I have to do is sit back, watch the markets, and then see price play out in the direction that I believed it was going to. And when I'm in a situation where the markets are good for trading and I'm in positions and I wait patiently because my analysis tells me I should and price moves in my favor and my positions grow in size uh, that is also very rewarding I get instant gratification from my work so uh, I'm constantly motivated to to work so that's how I look at it okay I don't get bored I don't sit in front of the screens and say I'm bored I want to get into trades because I have a thousand other things I could do that are that don't involve trading that's studying charts studying the data I mean I can go on forever just studying charts and studying the data and reading the story of price it always comes down to that <clears throat> the thing is that if you're doing um, different type of analysis that is not looking into the reality of what's happening in the chart you can what they call analysis paralysis you can have analysis paralysis analysis paralysis is that you do so much analysis that you're getting so many conflicting um, results or so many conflicting conclusions that's a problem you shouldn't be having so many conflicting conclusions if you're really studying the charts and extracting the real information the longer you put into looking at the chart the closer to the truth you should receive that's how it should work there is no analysis paralysis when you're doing real analysis the true analysis as we like to call it looking at the charts and extracting the truth of what's taking place you don't get analysis paralysis during that you're actually getting closer to the truth all right we're gonna have to wrap up soon um, hit the like button if you don't mind one more time if you haven't, uh, let's see, uh, read the rest of your questions. I have set my alarm to remind me to check on my wife. <laughs> That's funny, Jason. Yeah, you get so busy with the charts, you got to set the alarm. Make sure to check with your wife. 
uh, the more I learn, the more I'm motivated. Yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. Well, same thing. I feel the same way. The more I learn about the markets, the more I'm motivated to learn more about the markets. Uh, okay, so do you use news reports? Never. Never. I just look at news just to see how they're suckering people into doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. Uh, okay, that's it. Great. Well, that was a good session. I think that was a good introduction to the CFTC data and the spreadsheets that I work on and how I use them. In future sessions, we'll go deeper into them and examine um, uh, how we use the data to determine if uh, price is going to reverse, uh, if they're hedging their positions. There's so much. We can go on forever, okay, about the caught data. There's so much information just so much once you start to realize just how much information there is about the caught data you're never going to look at the caught data the same way ever again okay but that's it for me and uh it's 10 o'clock one hour we spent together